she took 
excellent student, but uncharacteristically, she became depressed and dropped out of school during her senior year. After more than two years of dating, Lindsay knew her relationship with Will was affecting her life negatively. She wanted to end it, but had no idea how to break it off. Lindsay loved to play online video games and used the nickname Demon underscore Nurse. One of her regular opponents in the online game was a 20-year-old from Seattle named Brandon Leonard. After several months of playing online with Brandon, they began chatting and sending photos to each other. Uh-oh, I know exactly how this story is about to play out. Though they had not met in person, it wasn't long before the exchange formed into an online romance. Though Lindsay was now committed to her online boyfriend, Brandon, she still had, she still had not broken it off with Will. As with many 18-year-old girls, she just didn't know how to do it and kept putting it off. During the same time, Lindsay had heard the Disney Animation Studios had opened an office in Sydney and they were looking for a trainee animation artist. It was her dream job. Lindsay submitted her illustrations as did over 300 other applicants. To her delight, Lindsay was the most talented of the applicants and started her new exciting career with Disney. Lindsay's parents were elated. Her attitude toward everything began to change back to the old Lindsay. She started dressing in more presentable clothes, went back to her cheerful attitude, and saw Will less and less. Brandon was happy for her as well, and the two of them were now madly in love. That's when Brandon proposed to her over the internet, and she joyfully accepted. On September 8, 2003, Lindsay knew it was time to break it off with Will. Brandon was flying to Sydney the next day, and she knew it had to be done. When she told Will it was over, he was heartbroken and angry. He cried, pled with her, and told her he would kill himself. But she was steadfast and ended their relationship. However, she didn't tell him about Brandon or that they were planning to get married. When Brandon arrived in Sydney, the two of them were a happy, a happy couple, planning the rest of their lives together. Will had no intentions of letting her go. He began stalking her on her way to work at her new job. When Will inevitably saw Lindsay with Brendan, he exploded in anger, knowing he could never get Lindsay back. He confronted Brandon at the apartment where he was staying. considering the S word taking himself out <laughs> he was still deeply in love with Lindsay but he hated her at the same time his anger consumed him Lindsay was terrified Will spent almost every day following her to and from work he would be waiting at bus stops knowing the times she was due to show up he would even stand across the street in the middle of the night, staring her up at her bedroom window. This went on for two months. He wanted her to know he would be a part of her life, whether she liked it or not. Brandon wanted Lindsay to meet his parents, and the two of them made plans to travel back to Seattle for Christmas. On November 22nd, Lindsay got a text from Matheson. I see you, was all it said. Terrified, she broke down crying. Her parents reassured her and told her not to worry. She would leave for Seattle soon and it all would be over. On November 24th, one of Lindsay's co-workers at Disney noticed her arguing with a young man outside of the office during the lunch break. This is about to get bad. I can see it already. He could see it was a heated argument, but didn't want to interfere. That 
same evening, Lindsay took the train back to her home in Queens Park. She got off the train at the Bondi Junction Railway Station, where she was seen on security cameras at 5.55 p.m. leaving the station. That would be the last time she was seen alive. I know it. That evening, when Lizzie didn't arrive at home at her normal time, Brandon and her parents became very worried. Though they tried all night long, there was no answer from her phone, no text messages. Early the next morning, Brandon called the police and reported his fiance missing. Her parents explained to the police that it was completely out of character for Lindsay to disappear on her own. They also informed the police that she was being stalked by her ex-boyfriend, Will Matheson. The family suspected Will had something to do with her disappearance, and Lindsay's older sister, Louis, called Will to see what he had to say. Will claimed he had seen Lindsay that evening as she got off the train. The train Bondi Junction. He told Louise that he had walked with her toward her home for about 10 or 15 minutes, then left her. That don't even sound right. He said that the last time he saw her was in an alley behind the Jerry, the Sharing Cross pub. Louise thought it was odd that Lindsay would be in an alley behind a pub. Walking through an alley was not something that Lindsay would normally do. Adding more confusion to the call. Will's eccentric father burst in on the line during their conversation and said, quote, well, I didn't see any blood on his hands, end quote. This startled Louise, and she later informed police about the strange conversation. Two days after she had gone missing, the police pulled Matheson into the station for an interview. He was calm and more so. Speaking in a monotone, his, his demeanor alone raised the police's suspicion. Again, Matthewson stuck to his story and said that he had walked with her after she had got off the train, then left her. Investigators asked for a DNA swap, fingerprints, and photographs, and Matthewson agree, agreed. But when he pulled off his shirt for the photo photographs, it raised hairs on the back of the investigator's necks. He had several cuts and scrapes on his chest, hands, and arms. He also had scrapes on his knees. Will explained that the cuts and scrapes were from his rats and cats, and he claimed the scrapes on his knees were from a skating board fall. Matthewson told the police that when he heard Lindsay was missing, he called her family and friends. But the police noticed something he had omitted. He didn't mention that he had actually tried to call Lindsay. If he believed she was still alive, he would have tried to call her. This was yet another aspect of the interview that raised the police's suspicion. They were sure he was involved, but with no definitive evidence they had to let him go. Detectives retraced their last steps and an extensive search of the area began. Police searched parks and streets in the area and divers searched the lakes in Centennial Park near her home, near her home but their efforts garnered no clues. Police then showed Lindsay's worker, co-worker, a lineup of mugshots to see if he had recognized the person that was arguing with Lindsay outside of her office that day. He easily pointed out Will Matthewson. Two weeks after Lindsay's disappearance, police received a phone call at 1.30 a.m. from a member of the public reporting that they thought was a prowler. When the police arrived, they found Will Matheson walking the streets and alleys carrying a backpack. Inside that backpack was another backpack containing several suspicious items. A pair of metal scissors, a box cutter, 
bags, several newspapers, moisturizer, and a small bottle of water. Matheson told police it was holy water. They need the holy water. Police brought Matheson in for questioning, and again, his demeanor was subdued. He claimed the items were for a picnic. This is the conversation between Will and the investigator. Investigator, what can you tell me about those items? Will, I was going to um go up to the park and have a picnic. Investigator, at 1.30 in the morning. Will, you. Yeah. Police suspected Lindsay was already dead and his plans were to dismember and dispose of her body. That sounds about right. Again, they had no definitive evidence that they could use to hold him. Matthewson was free to go, but police began a 24-hour surveillance on him. On January 10th, 2004, the maintenance man went into the storage room and noticed a mattress covering an interior doorway. When he pulled the mattress away and pushed the door open, a horrid smell knocked him back. The small room was filled with junk, boxes, and furniture. As he pushed aside items and made his way to the back of the room, he noticed an oversized sports bag. It was a huge bag used to carry cricket bats and equipment. He tried to pick it up but couldn't. It was too heavy. Barely able to handle the foul smell, he dragged the bag out of the room into the open air. He then used a pocket knife to cut it open and a small human hand fell out. When detectives arrived, they had a sinking feeling it was the body of Lindsay Van Blinken. Before they had a chance to identify her, the media got word of the body being found and broadcasted on the news. Lindsay's grandmother saw the news and called her granddaughter Louise and asked if it might be Lindsay. Louise assured her grandmother that if it was Lindsay, the police would surely have alerted the family before they would let the media know. Louise's curiosity overwhelmed her, and she called the lead investigator. Sadly, the investigator told her that it might be the body of Lindsay. Using the clothes she was wearing and the engagement ring on her finger, they positively identified her as Lindsay Van Blinken. And I bet you, I bet you after this he took himself out. I guarantee you. And if he did, I'll be extremely surprised. She had been strangled. Two cable ties had been put together to make a loop large enough to slip over her head. And a quick pull would have ricocheted down on her throat. The loop had been tightened down to only 10 inches, closing off her ability to breathe. Her fingernails were almost ripped off, most likely from scratching her attacker. Her body had been folded and stuffed into the bag like trash, then tucked in the corner of the storage room for eight weeks. The next day after Lindsay's body was found, Will Matthewson was having a mental breakdown. He told his father he was hearing voices in his head. Will sat his father down in front of the television and showed him the nightly news he had recorded of Lindsay's body being found. His parents called the hospital and mental health workers admitted him into a psychiatric hospital where he remained for the next eight weeks. Will's father said, quote, so he came inside and looked at the midnight news and when he finished looking at it, he just sat down and cried. He said, I think I've done that. And he pulled his legs onto his chest in the fetal position and just cried and cried, end quote. Because Will had been admitted to a mental hospital, police were not able to question him, but they were allowed to search the family home. Inside Will's bedroom was a stench, almost as bad as a rotting corpse. corpse. But the smell came from his rats and rat excrement. There were rats everywhere and the ceiling was covered with flies. Oh my god. Will had collected clippings from all the newspapers with any stories pertaining to Lindsay. The room was full of keepsakes of Lindsay, such as notes, letters, and videotapes. He became a 
obsessed with her. Also in his room was Lindsay's diary of notes and drawings. It was a very personal and precious diary to her that she would never have given it to Will or anyone else. The most incriminated evidence was found in the top drawer of his dresser. They found a small dictaphone and two tapes. When police played the tapes, they found out they're considered to be a confession. One tape had a song he had recorded in a muted, tragic voice. The lyrics were, quote, Just the other day, I watched you pass away. He said, I love you, please let me stay. Hope is not here for you or me. Close your eyes, when you go is where I be. I'll meet you in eternity, end quote. He also spoke in a whispering voice into the dictaphone, quote, it's all because of him. He didn't want you to hurt me as a friend. I hope you understand that I didn't want to let you go. I told you I didn't want to let you go. End quote. And many of the additional musings on the tapes he spoke of Lindsay in the past tense. When detectives questioned his parents, Will's father admitted that he had been shopping with his son in Bondi Junction two days before Lindsay went missing. He told police that when Will returned to the car, he was carrying a large sports bag. The bag that Lindsay's body was found in was a very specific type of cricket bag. Using the brand and model of the bag, police were able to find that there was only one store in the area which carried that specific bag, and they had only sold one of them. It was sold two days before Lindsay went missing at 1.30 p.m. for $120 and was paid for in cash. Investigators then searched through security cameras in the Bondi Junction Shopping Center during the time that Will's father said the two of them were there. They found footage of Will walking near Rebel Sports just before 1.30 p.m. In March of 2004, Will Matheson was discharged was discharged from the psychiatric hospital and police immediately brought him back in for additional questioning. Despite his admission to his father and to the hospital staff, during his interrogation, he continued to deny any involvement in Lizzie's death. Even when shown the video evidence, Matthew still denied purchasing the sports bag. Detectives then took Matthewson on a walk around Bondi Junction and ended up at the storage room where her body was found. He admitted that he and Lindsay had been in the storage room months before, but claimed he had never been into the interior room. When they asked him to walk into the interior room and told him that was where her body was found, he broke down and asked to leave. Quote, can we go somewhere else? Can we just go somewhere else? End quote. Again, without sufficient grounds, the police let him go while they gathered more evidence. Surprisingly, just a few days later, Matthewson requested another interview with the police. He had something to tell them. In the subsequent interview, Matthewson confided that he had been hearing voices this is a conversation between Matthewson and the police. Well, quote, I've been under distress of mental problems, hearing voices, and the such, end quote. Police, what are these voices saying to you, end quote? Well, quote, just to cause destruction, to kill people, to cause harm to myself, end quote. Despite having no previous diagnosis, Matthewson and his parents claimed he was mentally ill. On May 19, 2004, police arrested Will Matthewson for the murder of Lindsay Van Blinken. The prosecution spent the next year and a half preparing for the trial. During the trial, Matthewson was an emotionless as ever and had trouble maintaining eye contact with anyone in the courtroom. Despite his claims of mental illness, the prosecution showed that the murder was premeditated. He had purchased the cricket bag just two days prior to killing her. He had tied two cable ties together and trimmed off the edges, making it easier to slip over her head. He had lured her to the storeroom and had the bag there waiting for her. All the evidence showed that he had clearly planned the murder ahead of time. 
side. 